Oh, goodness. Well, good morning. We're kind of chuckling because uh, Bo didn't hit the record button last time we did this, and Tom's been kind enough to come back on again and do another interview. So this is uh, take two. <laughs> this is my friend Tom Noggle, also an amazing uh, Zen body work therapy practitioner. Uh, Tom's a uh, author and creator of Rider's Seat Method and internationally recognized clinician who's changing the way people understand how biomechanics affect the movement of their horse. And Tom shares his perspective from a three degree black belt in Aikido and advanced practitioner in Zen body therapy, which combines deep tissue and alignment work. If that wasn't enough, 30 plus years of being a Zen teacher. So welcome, and uh, we're here this morning with Coherence Horsemanship Institute, and we are inspiring people to question the status quo and embrace a new era of understanding, learning, and collaboration. So I'm here today collaborating with my friend Tom. Um, I would love for you to share with everyone, uh, how, first of all, how you got started in all things Zen. Well, first, good morning, Shinobu. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I got I started all things Zen because I was uh, actually training in Aikido in Chicago. And I was living in a warehouse with my Aikido instructor. And uh, over the weekend, uh, he was, uh, that's, where, that's where I was living. And so over the weekend, he said, oh, we're going to have a Zen retreat. Please join us. You'll like it. So basically, I, I, I started Zen. Uh, a Zen master came from Hawaii, Tanui Roshi. And we did a Zen retreat. Uh, in the warehouse that I was living at. So uh, it was November 11th, I think in 1979. Wow. So, uh, and I still remember it because it, it was the most painful experience of my life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're gonna like this. <laughs> we had no heat uh, because we weren't supposed to be living there. And so, uh, and I was basically living there to help uh, my Aikido instructor pay rent. And so uh, we showed up and uh, I probably would have left, but I, was, I had nowhere to go. So I, I stuck it out. <laughs> <laughs> but I met my Zen teacher there and actually he inspired me to continue training in Zen. So that, that's how I started my Zen training is by accident. By accident and purpose. Yes. <laughs> Love that. How life yeah. sets us on a track, right? Even when we're not expecting that. So right. then fast forward, you've taken all of this learning and then you've created the rider seat method. Can you share with the audience how those two things came together? Basically what happened was I I'd practiced Aikido for many years and I'd done the Zen body therapy and the Zen meditation. Uh, but I wasn't a natural in terms of using my body. And it wasn't until I was on the back of our horse, Mo, and I was on a trail ride with my wife, Jane, that I actually experienced how to use my psoas muscles correctly. And, uh, and I had one of these aha moments where I used to get in the saddle and, uh, and you know, I wasn't really enthusiastic, enthusiastic about going on a trail ride because Every time we went to a, a trot, I would bounce. <laughs> and the more I bounced, the tighter my body got. And, and then, then I tried to relax and I bounced more. And so I tried all these things to do it. And actually the horse would eventually go into a canter and then I'd have to slow him down and we'd eventually go back into a walk. So it was kind of like, uh, it was either just walking or a lot of excitement. <laughs> so, so I really didn't look forward to it. However, on one of the trail rides I went on, actually I, I uh, felt a scooping feeling inside my body. And actually, I'd been taught to set the tantian or set the hara from martial arts about the, the mid, middle area of the body. And I'd always tried to make that set come basically from the outside. So I'd either squeeze my abs or squeeze my butt, my glutes, uh, uh, to, to try to get that stability. But the problem was when you squeeze from the outside, any muscles that you squeeze, you stop your movement. And to do Aikido correctly, you have to keep moving. And basically, the essence of all martial arts is to receive and let flow. So um, if, you, if you can receive something, but you're stuck, you basically get hit. <laughs> so the idea is, is to be able to receive it, get out of the way, and let it move back, on, back out. So here I was riding the back of a horse, and, uh, and we went into a, a trot. And for some reason, I felt a scoop inside my body. And my hips weren't locked uh, because I had a lot of body work. So I had a bilateral motion. I can move one side up and then the other. And, and all of a sudden I could ride the trot. And I'm thinking, wow, this is fun. This is probably why people ride horses. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Although I kind of think that some of them are experiencing that 
that Frozen received the energy as a punch. And yeah, and, and they're, they're bouncing too, right? And, yeah. And the fact that if, if you don't have a bilateral motion in your body, when horses move, they move one side, then the other, bilaterally, right? All four-legged beings, one side, then the other, one side. Actually, humans are bilateral also. But it, so if you're not moving bilaterally with your horse at the, at the walk, you actually wipe the saddle. You go back and forth, right? <laughs> And, at the, and you see people riding that way. They're, they're, their hips are locked and they're going back and forth, uh, which basically is, is jamming yourself into the horse's back and making them come hollow out uh, and they can't lift their back. And then the, the next thing is, is that at the trot, because it's bilateral, if you're unilateral, you just bounce up and down, which is what I did. Now, if you uh, spend months and, and, and years on a lunge line and ride a horse, you eventually will learn how to uh, how to ride the horse. Your body will learn how it works, and yes. you'll probably well, fall off a lot too. <laughs> With no saddle, yes, you figure it out pretty quickly. Right. But that's actually how a lot of people learn how to ride their horses. And it turns out that once I once I could engage my psoas, I became stable because the psoas are the only muscles that actually connect the spine directly to the legs. So the only muscles that actually connect connect the upper girdle to the lower girdle. So can uh, you? Um, I just wanted to pause you for one second because I know from experience that a lot of people don't know, number one, they've never heard of a psoas, and number two, they don't know where those are. And uh, nobody, well, I, I've had the experience of feeling where they are, which is pretty incredible. And the image that came instantly when you showed that to me was that the horse has exactly the same thing. But yes. where, where are those muscles located, Tom? Well, they're, they're deep inside the body. And so a lot of people talk about the core muscles of the body, about using your core muscles when you ride. Uh, but a lot of them are talking about using the rectus muscles or the transverse abdominis or the obliques, uh, which are basically the surface muscles of the body still. Uh, the psoas are, no, are located underneath all the organs and they're actually, they actually are right in front of the spine on the front side of the body. And they attach from the lumbar vertebrae all the way down to the uh, there's a little bump on the legs called the lesser trochanter of the femur, and there's a bump on the legs and they attach down to the, to the legs. So basically when you level your pelvis and what, what I call a scooping feeling, it actually tones the inside of your legs automatically. So it, it turns out that, that almost all, uh, actually all expert riders are using their psoas muscles. However, what I found is they're, most of them are not conscious of it. They do it unconsciously. It's called unconscious competence. In other words, they can do it, uh, and, but, but, then, but then they'll say things that, that they've been taught by their instructors. They'll say, hear things like sit deep in the saddle or sit on your pants pockets. That's the Western one. Ride from your center. Uh, ride, ride with your thighs. I've heard that one. Um, I just heard a, a video of the, then the guy who was talking about it was really a, a, talking about posture. He's, he had excellent posture himself. And he says, take your navel back to your spine. Okay? So to me, and those are all things that the people are talking about because they have an experience, but actually the, the core muscles are your psoas muscles. And this is, um, so I've got a picture of them on my, on my website. I've got a blog up there now, and it does show a picture of the psoas muscles. Uh, so I think it's easier to see them that way. In my clinics, I have a, a model, I call him Slim, who's, um, who you can see, see the, uh, and he, he, he'd like to come on the program, but, but he's not, he's, he's still in the suitcase right now. Where, <laughs> <laughs> He's got a cool boy hi hiatus right now. So. <laughs> but that's my skeleton model, which shows the psoas muscles. But actually what happens is, is that when you use them correctly, they actually fall back and stabilize the lower back. Mm -hmm. And so when people are talking about the core muscles and they say they're the erectus muscles or the stomach muscles, I say, well, it's like if you, if you ask me for the core of the apple and, and I give you the skin around the middle, it's like I'm not deep enough. So basically you have to go deeper. Uh, and once, if you can get the psoas muscles in place and learn how to use them, everything else follows. So can you, um, I, I know people will be curious, are there three things that you could share with the viewing audience that would help them utilize those muscles or connect to those muscles, seeing as most people have never had that experience, or like you said, they. They've had the experience, but they can't verbalize what it is that they're doing in a way that helps other people to truly connect to that part of their body. 
Uh, best way is to uh, learn the SOAS method exercises that I have in my book or, or in oh, my course. The writer's book? method. Yeah, they're in there. Yeah. <laughs> this a series is a of, I think there are nine exercises. Okay, so and this is, I wanted to say this earlier, but Zen and Horseback Riding, this is Tom's great book and it's available on your website and on it's Amazon? It's available through Amazon. Amazon, right. okay. Right. Yeah. But you also get a free PDF copy if you join the course, so that's, uh, ah. so that's a bonus. Yes, yeah, so for everybody viewing, Tom, uh, zenandthehorse.com, is this correct? Yeah, three, four words, zen and the horse. All one yeah. spelled yeah. out, yes, and he has a lovely course that is the writer's method online that people can connect to anywhere in the world, which is amazing. Right. Um, so... As you're teaching, oh, I, I was asking for those three things. So are there three things that you could pull out that you could share with people that would be helpful? Uh, your, your pelvis has to be level. Okay. In other words, most people aren't, don't ride where they're slumped over. They're pretty, they're most, the, the problem usually is when people are too, are too straight, they're too, and when their back becomes concave, which they have an arch in their back. Okay. So they have to be able to, to basically uh, flatten the lower back and that comes from inside if you squeeze from the outside you basically compress everything and stop your motion so I would say one thing is you have to level the pelvis and then you have to move bilaterally in other words one side and then the other you have to move bilaterally and the third thing would be is is actually it turns out that you've heard the saying follow the motion of the horse right or follow the motion movement of the horse as it turned out what my experience is is that you actually have to allow the motion of the horse and you have to actually ride vertically, which might seem strange because actually when you're riding, it's a three-dimensional movement. You're actually moving vertically and horizontally. But, it, but my experience is, is that it's the horse's job to take you horizontally. If you stay vertically in that sweet spot and move bilaterally, then you actually can lift, help the horse lift their backs. Okay. So That was my I next if, question. How does that? I think if you, I think if you look at if you think about riding vertically, it changes how you ride. Because most people think, oh, follow the motion of the horse. The horse is horizontal, so they're going, especially the beginner riders, they're pushing the horse with their, with their seat. They're trying to push forward. If they can just stay, stay in that one sweet spot and move, which is where the saddle is, and move vertically. In other words, think of your motion as coming, as coming this way. Uh, then you have a much better chance of, of getting out of your horse's way and allowing them to move freely. And so, and I understand that and have actually experienced that myself. Can you explain what it is that you see visually happen in the horse when the energy of the horse is received by the person instead of the other way around, where the person's trying to cause the horse's motion? Well, basically what happens is that the horse is moving, and we have a, a, a simple exercise where it's called the horse rider exercise, where you actually, there's a person who gets on all fours and they're on the, on the, on the ground, they're the horse. And then there's the rider. And as the rider, if you, what you do, you experience first, you go, you go unilaterally, horizontally. And as the horse, you, you feel like you're being <laughs> pushed this way. And then I want you, then I say, now go unilaterally, then I say, go bilaterally, horizontally. So people start moving one side and then the other. But basically for the horse, it's like you're getting thrown this way. And then I say, okay, now I want you to move vertically, bilaterally. Think of coming up and not forward. And all of a sudden, if you're the horse, you, you want to actually feel like you're lifting your back. And it's a, it's a really feel, a feeling of freedom. So my riding instructor, Karen Erland, and I think you've had Karen on the show, she says uh, what she experiences is she creates space between her and her horse, Andy. And by creating that space and staying vertically, he lifts his back. Yes. And Karen was the first person that actually said, you need to move vertically. She says, you know, horses are horizontal beings, humans are vertical beings. She knows you need to support your own vert verticality at that sense. So that's, so I learned that from Karen, but it just, and I learned it through riding on, uh, on a horse named Molly. And uh, once, once I got that motion and, and became vertically and kept moving, and it was actually a little figure eight on its side motion vertically, Molly moved right out. So the, the thing is also is that what I want to say is that if I'd like people to start looking at their horses as teachers, mm. all right? 
Because most of the time we have an agenda and we say, well, okay, I want to do this with my horse. I want to do this with the horse or my horse isn't doing this or they're not doing this. But actually the horse is giving you feedback all the time as to what, what they're experiencing in your body. So if you can, if you can actually feel that, uh, that, that if it's in your body correctly, your horse will give you the feedback. And actually this is what happened when I was, I wasn't, I didn't have that motion uh, I was too vertical with my bilateral motion. And Karen said, you're not sitting in the saddle. And I said, okay, what do I do? And she said, take your feet and move, move them in like little figure eights on the side. And I did that and my feet started moving and I could feel my knees moving and my hips. And all of a sudden my nose was moving like this, that little figure eight. And, and all of a sudden Molly lowered her head and trotted out. Whereas before she was like, I'm trying to get her to go get her. All of a sudden when my movement became correct, she actually showed me it was correct. And that's, that's when I experienced what a schoolmaster is, is they're able to show you when your movements are correct. Yes. They don't do it for you. A schoolmaster, you can get a, you can get a bit of beginner rider at a schoolmaster and they don't become an expert rider, but the schoolmaster can, can let the rider know, oh, that's correct. This is this, what you did. When you did this, I give you this. So, uh, and there are not a lot of schoolmasters out there anymore. So that's, that's no, uh, they're not. You, can, you can get that feedback from them. Yeah. Well, I would have to say that all horses are schoolmasters in some sense. So if we can learn to, as you said, um, to receive the energy and the information instead of having judgment on what they're doing based on what they're doing instead of how we're receiving or not receiving. Right. And a lot of, a lot of times what happens is people have an agenda when they have to get on their horse. And what, what really keeps us from being on our horse is, is basically is our thoughts. A lot of us ride in our minds. A lot of us live our lives in our minds. And you have and, a statement in your book about that. And I thought that that was really interesting. Um, I don't know if I can pull that back up again. Um, no, not off the, do you know the statement that I'm talking about? Living, living moment by moment, viewing your thoughts. Right, that's the, the idea is, is that uh, in my clinics, I, I put three dots up on the board but or on the screen on the, and the thing. And I say, I say, what do you see? And most people say three, three black dots, but, uh, uh, but there's a, a certain group of people. Most of the art, art artistic groups say, Oh, I see three holes. In the white <laughs> okay. And either way is, is correct. But most of the idea in our, in our society, we're taught in our educational system to, is to see the dots, to get the right answer, to get the, the, the correct result. And so most of us are focused on the dots. So I say, okay, now think of your dots as being thoughts, all right? And that's not a representation of people's mind because if we put the thoughts up there, there'd be, the, there'd be dots everywhere. <laughs> dots, 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 dots. And these are all our thoughts. And this is where most of us live all the time. So, and the nice, the fun thing about dots is, is you not only do you have dots, but it's fun to connect the dots, <laughs> right? And so you'll, I'll see people at clinics, you know, and they'll be watching the people riding, but Actually, what they're doing is they'll be connecting the dots with the, their, their fellow people that are watching. So they're saying, oh, do you remember this? Or do you remember this? And basically, they're missing what's going on because they're busy connecting dots. Oh, and, and nothing wrong with dots. But at the same time, if you will, what I like to teach people is to see if, there's, see if you can experience the space between your thoughts. Experience the space between the dots. And then it gets interesting. And, and, and in Zen meditation, that's where the Zen background comes in. Zen meditation, the quickest way to do that is what we say, look 180 degrees. Yeah. In other words, so instead of focusing out and looking here, I'm actually going to look and expand my vision out so that I can see everything. And basically, it, it, things in front get a little blurry, but basically looking for movement. And this is actually, if you, if you can, uh, at the end of uh, my clinics, at the end of the third day, I have people look 180 degrees as they're riding at a walk. And I say, great, stay in your own bubble. Just keep yourself safe. Look 180 degrees. And this is a way that, that actually from myself, it actually puts me right in my body yeah. because now I can feel my body. I'm not looking out here. What am I supposed to be doing? This, that. I just, I go directly into my body and I just, and, I, and what I'm looking for is to experience that space in between your thoughts. And the thing that's ironic is it's always there. <laughs> Is there right now? For there sure. for you, there for me. It's there for everyone who's listening, actually. If they think about it, there's always 
something that is basically watching. It's always been there. It's always with you. But our minds get busy. Oh, no, 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 okay, I got you. Oh, okay. But in, in some sense, so that's what we're looking for is to have that experience of being there. And actually, that's also the horse's experience because the horse's eyes are looking like this all the time, right? So that way you, you can start to, um, to experience your horse's frame of mind also. That's a fascinating statement. I yeah. love that. Yeah. So just as a synopsis, as we open our focus wide, it allows us to be more connected to the inside or the upper vision of what we're doing. Is that, yes. is that yeah. clear? So it gives us that higher perspective of everything that's going on in the moment instead of being focused on a dot. <laughs> right. I mean, focused on, oh, did I get that counter transition or did I get this? And actually sometimes getting something good is, is even worse than getting it wrong. <laughs> like, oh, I got that great counter, counter transition. It's great. It's, but it's like courses like, what's next? Yeah. We're, we're already <laughs> on to the next thing. We're, yeah. Next, next, next. So in other words, we, we want to say, well, I, you know, some people say, well, I, I don't want that, don't want this, but it, they get, oh, I want this. But as soon as you hold on, either to, either, either you try to push it away or hold on, basically you're not receiving and letting it flow. We have to hold it this way. Yeah. So, so martial arts, so riding a horse becomes a martial art in a sense that you receive from the horse and then you let it flow. And you can only receive it if you're moving your body correctly, if you're breathing correctly. And then if your awareness, your, if your posture is correct and your breath is correct and your awareness starts to change. So this is where we first start with posture. And then we talk about breathing. And actually we, we teach people how to use their breath as a get ready signal as in a half halt to the horse that something's going to happen. So it's, it's a lot of fun. I've connected all the dots. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We have to have dots to communicate. We have to, there's nothing wrong with it, but, but know that there's something more. Yes. Okay. Well, Guinness, what a great way to end an amazing conversation. And thank you for all of that. And so many things that I'm sure people um, haven't heard or they've heard and they didn't truly understand what they were hearing. And you've clarified that for them. So I really appreciate that, Tom, and appreciate your teaching. And I really want to encourage people to connect to zenandthehorse.com where Tom Noggle's rider seat method system is all there for you and uh, we hope to be talking to you really soon thank you Shinobu. have a wonderful rest of the day well, you too all right bye-bye